step into the mic today, you have crew, Chris Miles, Ted Jeffries, and our friend Hollywood, Dan Helly. Uh, let's start with this, Dan, because sometimes you, you don't meet someone, this is our first time talking, but they're inspirational to you. So I'm going to tell you a story of, that you did on Victor Oladipo and DeMathis Gym. Um, I was trying to break into the D.C. market. I'd left New Orleans. I was like, man, I got to tell good stories here in D.C. There are a lot of them. And I watched NBC4, and you were sitting in the gym with Victor Oladipo. I think he was you know, preparing for the NBA draft after his time in Indiana. And I was like, man, this guy has a good rapport with him. I got to go with this style when I get the opportunity. And sure enough, uh, one of the ways I got the job at NBA TV was I did a shooting contest with Victor Oladipo in uh, the Mathis gym. So you were telling a story before we started this podcast about the rich history of the Mathis hoops. And when you went in there and conducted that interview with Mike Jones's kids. Yeah, you know, I, I went to Magruder High School, which was a public high school in Montgomery County. And we have one of the, the legendary high school basketball coaches, in my opinion, in the area in Dan Harwood. Um, and he is one of those guys who is, is Belichickian in a way that he does less with more, I think. And we were on the very front end of that kind of public school basketball dynasty. And he started scheduling DeMatha a couple of times. And of course I was a huge high school sports junkie growing up in the area. Like I knew, you know, remember back in the day, uh, Ted, like Harker prep, you know, with x ray and all those dudes and, yes, dude. um, you know, I just, I followed everything. I would, I would open up the Gazette and the Montgomery County Journal, and I could tell you who the leading receiver was in high school football. And I just, I just loved it. And so I knew all about the math and the rich history there and what an intimidating uh, place that was to play and a team to play against. And um, Dwayne Simpkins was there when, when we played him. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a time frame. And so when I got back to NBC4, one of the things I really wanted to do was, get to know all the high school coaches in the area. And Mike Jones is just the best man. Like I still, we still hit each other up on Instagram every now and then. And um, I went there to do a story uh, on a young man um, who was going to go to Tennessee. And I don't know if he was late for practice or something, but Mike's like, Hey man, maybe you want to check these guys out. And uh, he's told me about the story of, of Quinn cook and how his father had passed. And, um, just the, the relationship he had with his teammates and how that really helped kind of forge him and f help him grow into manhood essentially. And uh, so we did the story and uh, his relationship with Victor Oladipo and uh, you know, Jeremy Grant was on that team. There's a young man named James Robinson who went to Pitt. Um, I, I can't remember if Jerry and Grant was there that day or not, but we, we did the story on all these guys. And then I came, they came back the next year and we did kind of a reunion story. And we took this big picture uh, with all of us. And there's like four NBA players in this picture. And they all played on one team. How many times has that happened? You know, we had, when I was a Magruder, there's one NBA player that's come out of there. Jerome Williams, the junkyard dog who played at Georgetown with Iverson. And um, that's it. That's all we have. And, and DeMatha have four dudes on one team make the league. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's crazy because Jerome was undersized, right? He didn't develop to late. So it's not like he was that player at Magruder, right? Oh, no, 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 not at all. He, I mean, Jerome was not the star of that team. We had a guy named Silas Chung uh, who went on a play at Mount St. Mary's and helped lead them to the NCAA tournament. He teamed up with Chris McGuthrie there, a little mighty mouse, played over in Europe for a long time. So um, Silas was our best player, and Jerome was like 6'3", and we called Jerome the black hole because when you threw the ball inside to Jerome, it disappeared. It was not coming out. Right. Like he was putting that thing up. And so Jerome's deal was that he went to Montgomery college, I believe for a year and then committed to play for AU. And he played in the Kenner league and big John Thompson saw him play. And he had grown from six, three to six, nine in one summer. <laughs> and big John's like, Hey, I think you need to come play on the Hill. I don't know that you need to be going and playing, uh, you know, at AU. And he goes and he played with AI and he had a great run and he was a first round draft pick of the Pistons. And I remember how excited I was because I was interning at channel nine at the time for a guy named Ken brew. He had a cup of coffee in the DC market. And um, I'm like, Hey, I think I can, uh, 
And I think Ken Meese might've been filling in. I said, I think I can get Jerome Williams to come in and Jerome Williams to come in and talk about the draft. So I was so excited. That was like my first get, you know, and I was just an intern at channel nine and Jerome so great man came in and did the interview. And, um, and then he was a first round draft pick and had a great career, uh, made some pretty good money. I still talk to him. He lives out in Las Vegas and, uh, has a daughter who's at Georgetown right now. Wow. We're, we're old, man. We're old. <laughs> Well, you can tell by all the gray hair that I definitely am. Uh, well, I just shaved Ted, so else I'd have some gray too, man. I'm keeping this COVID coverage on right now, man. But I'll tell you what, you know, this is how small the world is. So Danny Harwood is great friends, and you'll probably know this name with Pete Strickland. Of Pete course. Strickland, yeah, Pete uh, coached me at DeMatha, and I had the good fortune of uh, coaching with him at Coastal Carolina for two seasons. So Danny Harwood would bring down his uh, team for team camp and – he and his, uh, his boys would come down and they'd play in camp. And I got a funny story. So, you know, as always, Pete is always uh, making sure that we're refereeing games and watching talent. So Danny's youngest um, youngest son is playing in team camp. And he's one of the better players in camp. He's a great kid. But he really let me have it after a call during the game. And he was like, God, you're the worst ref ever. And I looked around and I'm like, is this six-year-old kid talking to me? Like this? And I had to catch, I had to catch myself for a second. I was like, wait a minute, before I snatched this little kid up, I had to remember the relationship. Uh, but you know, Danny is a great guy. As you talked about, he's a fantastic coach in the area. Uh, one of the best, uh, period. Uh, and you know, you guys are fortunate to have, uh, played for such a, uh, iconic coach in that Montgomery County area, but those DeMatha and, and, uh, and uh, you know, those connections are, are definitely strong in this area. Yeah, man. He, he's the best coach. I, pl I played for some great coaches. I played for Roy Lester, who was a legendary football coach in, in Harwood. And the one thing about Harwood is you always knew where you stood. I mean, he would tell you now, like, hey, you are only going to take layups. You can only <laughs> shoot from 15 feet and in, and you can only shoot threes. And you, can, and you, gotta, you gotta spot up and shoot. You cannot shoot a three off the dribble. And it made us better as players because we really knew where we stood. Um, it made me hate him sometimes as a player, you know, because he, he I, I would get so mad. I remember, you know, we played Blair my senior year and I could not throw a ball in the ocean. I was probably, I don't know, like two for 30 from three point range over a few games. And so he benched me for a younger guy who I didn't think was as good. And we were playing Blair. They had a kid named Khalid Shakur. Uh, who was a good college player. I believe he went to the Mount as well. Anyway, long story short, they were ranked number one. I was benched, but I played a little bit, hit the game winner, and I was so selfish that I walked off the court after the game instead of enjoying the celebration with my teammates and with the school. They rushed the floor. and I mean, here's – you know, here's this team from Magruder that was like had a 500 record that just took down the, you know, number one team in the area, in the Washington Post. And um, – and it was a really big learning experience for me. And I was lucky enough to give the commencement speech at Magruder when I was working at Channel 4. And I, and I told that story. And it always just reminded me, it still reminds me today, sometimes to, to enjoy the moment. And what a moment that, you know, I was not a great athlete by any stretch of the imagination. That was one of the, that was probably the, one of the crowning achievements of my athletic career. And I just let selfishness ruin it for me. Um, and uh, I remember telling Harwood that story and, and, uh, and, and he, I just, I don't know. I really appreciate like what he did for me and what he did for does for all those kids still to this day, still coaching. When you talk yeah, about you say, going, in, go ahead, Chris. No, exactly. When you say enjoy the moment, I think of uh, us enjoying Chase Young right now in, in DC and what he's brought to this Washington football team. I actually have a couple of trivia questions to get to you, but let's start with Chase. Okay. Chase Young reminds you of fill in the blank. Oh, whoa, man. He, I, I can't really think of anybody because of how he's built. Like Jadavion Clowney would be the, the one in terms of physical presence that reminds me of him. But Clowney's weird because I've told this story a few times. I remember doing a post game show at NFL network and, uh, the Texans had played the Colts and this is when Frank Gore future hall of fame running back was playing for the Colts. And we had him as our onset guest and he was so tired after the game 
that he literally could had trouble forming a sentence because he just couldn't speak because he was so tired. I'm like, I'm like, Frank, you all right, man? He goes, man, I keep blocking that dude. And he pointed at Clowney walking off the field. He goes, that's a full-time job. He goes, blocking him is a full-time job. And he is such a physical specimen, but he just doesn't rack up those big sack numbers, you know? Um, whereas I don't, that's not an issue with chase, but I just, I just think from physicality standpoint, that's who, that's who he reminds me of. Excellent. I mean, I was trying to figure that out and I feel like Jadavian Clowney almost because like you say, the sack numbers aren't there and people kind of look at him as like, Oh, he was supposed to be the great, you know, player and he's really good, but is he that great, you know, generational talent? And I feel like Chase Young has the ability to be that after seeing what he did in his rookie season. So speaking of this past season for the Washington football team, right? We go back to the 2005 NFL draft because the number one pick in the draft, Alex Smith made his comeback last year. And mm -hmm. guess who's coming to town this year to be the quarterback, the 250th pick from the 2005 draft and Ryan Fitzpatrick. So I looked into their stats and have some questions for you. The first All question, right. more passing yards in their career, Alex Smith or Ryan Fitzpatrick? Alex Smith. It is indeed Alex Smith, but Alex Smith has uh, 35,000 yards. Ryan Fitzpatrick, 34,900. So he's like wow. right there. Right uh, the yeah, it surprised me. I did, I did not realize that. Um, I, are, you, are you asking me another one on Fitz or are you moving on from Fitz? Because I got a Fitz story for you. Oh, no. Go with the Fitz story, and then I got another trivia question. Okay, so we had uh, Terrell Owens in studio a while ago, uh, maybe five years ago. And I asked him who his favorite quarterback was. And he's played with a lot of great ones now, right? I mean, Steve Young and, and Jeff Garcia and Tony Romo and Donovan McNabb. And obviously we know he's not going to say Donovan, right? They had their spat at the end. He said his favorite quarterback was Ryan Fitzpatrick from his time in Buffalo at the tail end of his career. And I said, really? That's surprising. He said, Fitz trusted me all the time. So he would just throw it up, right? I mean, we know that. Like, he would just throw it up and let T.O. go get it. But that was his favorite quarterback from his Hall of Fame career with all these great quarterbacks was Fitz. And I think that's what's cool about Fitz is, the, hey, he trusts his guys. You know, you win some, you lose some, but he's going he's gonna to give you a chance to make a play. Uh, and that's what's yeah. exciting. Now, he's going to lose you a couple games now. I mean, let's let's not get it twisted. We we've seen him go from five touchdown passes one week to four interceptions the next. Like that will happen. So you have to know that there's a high there's a high ceiling and there's a low floor, and we're gonna see them both. Fits magic to fits tragic is what yep. they say, right? Uh, Thirty eight years old now too. So hopefully you still get that magic in less of the tragic. The next trivia question: Who has more career touchdowns? Fitzpatrick or Alex Smith? Ooh, I'll go. I'll go Fitz there. Not even close. Two hundred and sixty-six for Fitzpatrick. One ninety-nine for Alex Smith. I mean, that's a huge gap when you consider yeah. one guy was taken first in the draft, the other guy went in the seventh round. I was well, it's just like what well, it's just like what we said, right? I mean, Alex Smith historically, despite the fact he he played for that Kansas City offense, has been the you know I say this with air quotes game manager. Um, you know, and I don't, I always think there's such a negative connotation to game manager. And I, I'm, I promise you, I'm not trying to name drop. I'm just trying to story tell, but we had Joe Montana in studio one day. And I asked him about that game manager uh, moniker for Alex Smith. And he said, I was a game manager. Worked out all right for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was certainly considered the greatest quarterback of all time until we got into this Tom Brady era. And now it's, I think everyone says it's TB12, but that's a discussion for another day. Final trivia question for you. More touchdowns last season, the combo of Alex Smith and Dwayne Haskins or Fitzpatrick in his limited role last year? Fitz. Yes, 13 to 11. See, Dan Helley, we understand why you've been on the NFL network for years and why you do play by play for the NFL as well, because you absolutely nailed that trivia, right, TJ? Absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, we know that you have uh, achieved the, the status where you are right now. You're living out in LA, living the beach life to, to a small degree when you uh, get a chance to down, uh, you know, let your hair down. 
but let's talk about the journey on how you got there. You know, you leave Tennessee, you're a communications major, another communications major here from University of Virginia. But uh, let's talk about your journey uh, because it's almost emblematic of a basketball player to a certain degree because you can bounce around from place to place in pursuit of, you know, your career. Yeah, I would actually say, Ted, it's more like a minor league baseball player because you have to really climb the ladder and work your way up the ranks. It's a little different now in terms of how you can break in. You know, you can break in in a big market or even for a network, sometimes working on the digital side or doing a few other jobs there and then maybe working your way up on the air. Back when I was coming up, you did local TV and you went from literally rookie ball to single A to double A to triple A and then to the majors. And so my path um, leaving Tennessee, you know, I was lucky in that I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I went to college. Um, what I really wanted was to play football and at a small college. Uh, and when I, I took a couple of visits and I realized uh, I won't say the names of the colleges to offend anybody, but I had a couple of options there to play as like a preferred walk on. And they told me, Hey, if things go really well for you, these were D two schools. Now you can, uh, you can get, uh, work your way up to where we'll play, pay for your books, your sophomore year. <laughs> and I said, no, that's not exactly what I had in mind for a football scholarship. So I just bagged that idea. And I, I applied to, a, to big schools all over the country, literally in every section of the country. And, um, Tennessee was my first visit. I loved it. The weather was perfect. Uh, they had the big stadium. They had a small broadcasting department. And I did an internship at one of the local stations there and was lucky enough to, uh, to get a job as a cameraman my last three or four months of school. Full-time job. The uh, sports director at the time said, hey, Dan, this will be really good for you because no matter where you go, uh, Chris, you'll know this, you have to be a one-man band. You're going to have to shoot your own stuff. You're going to have to edit your own stuff. You're going to be the reporter, the anchor, the producer, everything. So if you get this job as a cameraman, which, by the way, is going to pay you real money. Real money at that time was $18,000. Um, you know, but it was my first job, my real job with you know, benefits and all this stuff. Um, you, know, you can know how to do this when you go to your first on-air job. So I did that for five or six months. I sent out resume tapes. At that time, you're not sending out links on an email. You're sending out physical tapes. They were VHS tapes. And I just peppered the country. Every single market that had an opening, I would fire a tape off to. And I got my first call from a little town in Minnesota, Alexandria, Minnesota. That was between Fargo and Minneapolis. And there, there were only three, there were three places I said I would never work. I didn't want to work in Alaska only because I was afraid if I went there, the next place that was going to hire me wouldn't want to fly me out because it would be too expensive. I didn't want to work in the Dakotas because they're the Dakotas. <laughs> and I didn't want to work in Arkansas because I thought there were too many hillbillies there. Okay. Um, and so I ended up in Alexandria, Minnesota, which was like an hour from the North Dakota border. And one of the things I covered were uh, high school football playoffs that ended up being played at the Fargo Dome in Fargo. So I remember laughing to myself as a 22-year-old. Here I said I would never work in North Dakota. Now I'm covering high school eight-man football in North Dakota. <laughs> um, but anyway, keep a long story short, I was there for nine months. Then I ended up in the Myrtle Beach market. I was there for a couple years. There I learned about NASCAR. That was their big league sport. But I was back in the, in the SEC in the, in the South, and, and college football was big. So we would cover – the South Carolina Gamecocks, we'd cover Clemson, um, and we'd go to their media days every week. So it felt kind of big time, you know, we'd cover mm -hmm. the Carolina Panthers. And then I went down to West Palm Beach, and we covered all the Miami stuff. Covered the Dolphins, uh, the Heat, the Marlins. From West Palm, I was there three years. I went up to Orlando, and that was kind of my first job where I got there, and I'm like, okay. You know, it's a top 20 market. They had the Orlando Magic. It was an event town. You had Bay Hill and – you know, Daytona was in that town. You had the Daytona 500. But that was the first time I got to the point where I was actually making enough money that I wasn't embarrassed to have the conversation with my friends about, you know, <laughs> career path and, and salary. And, um, you know, my wife had a good job there. We lived in downtown Orlando. I know when people think about Orlando, they just think Disney and Mickey Mouse, but it's actually a really cool town. Uh, my daughter was born there. And then nine weeks later, uh, we ended up moving up to DC, hired by George Michael and um, was there with Lindsay Zarniak and just a great crew. 
you know, I was the, the tail end of the sports machine there. We still had this powerhouse sports department with 20 plus people, um, some awesome producers and Richie Dunn and uh, Joe Schreiber and Jeff Greenberg, Mallory Crossland. Um, and then George ended up kind of uh, retiring eventually. And Lindsay and I were there together and we just had a great run. It was so much fun. We, you know, we got to, we got to cover the teams that we grew up rooting for and watching. Um, and that, that was my dream coming out to LA and working at NFL network and calling games was never my dream. My dream was to be in DC and cover the hometown teams. And, um, and that was, that was a phenomenal, phenomenal time to be there. Now I missed, I missed the, the championships, you know, I missed the world series win. I missed the Stanley cup. Um, that was a little bit of a bummer. I did get to go back um, and cover some stuff for NBC4 when the Nationals were out here playing the Dodgers uh, the year they went on their their World Series run. And um, I, I covered the first game or two, and then the clinching game, I wasn't working. And I have a buddy here who runs the Dodgers Sports Network uh, Spectrum, and uh, he – had me in his suite for the clinching game. And so I'm in the suite and there's, I don't know, 20 people. They're all Dodgers fans. A lot of them work for the Dodgers. <laughs> and there was one other young lady who was from the DC area and a Nats fan. And we were kind of like silently cheering throughout and you're high fiving in the suite, you know, kind of hurt. Sorry. And um, after the game, they, I, I still had my, my press credential. And uh, so after the game, I said, I kind of want to go down there to, you know, just check out the locker room and not have to not be working, but just get to watch it and, and soak it up, you know, the champagne and everything. And I looked at my buddy, he's like, oh, of course, go down, man. We'll just wait for you up here. So I went down for half an hour and saw Zim and Rizzo and just watched, you know, you're not sticking a mic in any, anybody's face. You could just be a fan. And uh, I still have the hat, man. I still have the champagne soaked Nats hat. Haven't washed it. Um, you know, from that, from that run, that was, that was pretty cool. That's fantastic. Well, that was going to be my next question to you was through all your travels, what was the best sporting event you've been to? So here's my list of things and how they're overrated and underrated, right? Because I always tell people the Super Bowl was so disappointing to me when I was there because it's so corporate compared to yeah. the AFC and NFC championship games. When you're at the NFC and AFC championship games, it is a crazy environment. You can't hear yourself. It's all fans. Then you get to Super Bowl. This has been my experience, the three of them. It's like, hmm, half the stadium, it's like business. And the other half, it's still the fans. So it doesn't have that same feel. So I guess the question for you, what sporting event outside of the Nats clinching and going to the World Series uh, is that moment for you where you're like, this is just incredible. I would rank... Uh, national championship for college football, being on the field for that, and NFC championship game is my top two. Well, I've been lucky enough to where I've been, I've been to all of them. Um, I've been to the World Series. I've been to the Super Bowl. I totally get what you're saying about the Super Bowl feeling corporate. Um, you know, there are times when, you know, NFL Network would have us out there for the whole week, and then we would fly back the day of the game, you know, because we were, if we weren't doing anything on, on game day. Um it's still pretty cool to be down there pregame, you know, for a Super Bowl and just the pageantry that goes along with it and the magnitude, you know, it's the most watched sporting event of the year. Um, probably the coolest moment I had uh, was the Super Bowl, the, the David Tyree helmet catch against the Patriots in the Super Bowl. It was in Arizona. I don't even remember the number, but that was the perfect season for the Patriots that was ruined by the Giants. And Wait, say that I, one more time. I'm, I'm a Giants fan. Say that. Yeah, you, you you remember that one, don't you? You you guys had a couple good ones against them. Um, so that was when I was actually working at NBC Four, and um, I was able to sneak onto the field in the fourth quarter because they're super tight with security. Now they have they have your badges, like you have to buzz yourself in. They scan your badge. Back then they didn't scan your badge. They would just kind of peek at it, and there was. Um, a, a, a huge crew of PR guys from all the NFL teams, you know, who are all about 
my age, you know, a lot of them look like me and you're walking down and they're wearing their suits, you know, and I'm like, hmm, let me just sneak in this line. And I got onto the field because they were all out there. So when the game ended, they all had different duties, right? One was going to get the winning quarterback. One was going to get the losing quarterback, losing coach, blah, 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 and take care of all their media responsibilities after the game. So I was in that line, just kind of snuck in. And I ended up being on the giant sideline for the last 10 minutes of that game. I mean, one of the most iconic Super Bowl moments in NFL history. And I actually worked with Sean O'Hara, who was the center, um, and David Carr, uh, who was the backup quarterback on that team. So it was really cool to be out there for that moment. So that was probably my greatest sports memory. In terms of covering events, I love the NCAA tournament. Love, love, love. When you go cover the first couple of rounds of the tournament, you're just you're sitting courtside and watching those games. You know, I remember two years in a row, I saw Steph Curry take down Maryland and Georgetown. You know, I'm like, oh, this kid's special, man. He's pretty good. And I was there for Georgetown's final four run. Um, you know, the Stanley Cup finals are pretty cool. Um, the the world, I like the World Series and I like I like college football national championship game. I think if I were a little more invested in the team, um, it's it, it's more special to me. Um, but I would say, I would say it's hard to beat. It's hard to beat the tournament. Um, NBA playoffs are pretty awesome. I remember when I was in Orlando and I mean, the magic were everything. And that's all we, that's all we had. That was our only pro team. And T-Mac was there with uh, Grant Hill. Grant Hill was injured off and on, uh, but T-Mac was it. And that was the heyday, man. That was when you know, he's leading the NBA in scoring. There, there were a few players at that time period that were more exciting to watch than T-Mac. And they played the Pistons in Detroit. And I don't know if you remember, but they went up, I think, 3-1 in that series. And T-Mac basically was speaking at his post-game press conference and kind of misspoke like it was already over. He was already talking about the next series. And the Pistons came back and won. And, and Tracy got crucified for it. <laughs> And he never got past the first round. So maybe it was 2-1. I don't know if it was a five-game series or seven-game series. Whatever it was, they were one game away from winning. Right. And, and T-Mac never got past the first round in his career. One of the great players of all time. Great dudes of all time. Really love covering him. So that's a long-winded answer uh, to your question, Chris. But, um, you know, I, 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 I think I said this to somebody else when we were talking about D.C. sports. When, when Gilbert – and Antoine and Karan and the Wizards were rolling. There was a few things that were more fun than cover than that group. And I remember, you know, I, I would wear these crazy socks and like everybody does it now. But back in the day, I started doing it because I walked into that locker room and Antonio Daniels is like, man, you look good. Your socks are just vanilla, man. You got to dress that up a little bit. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> So I go to the store and get some crazy socks. And I'm like, Antonio Daniels said, I need to spice up my sock game. <laughs> and then they draft RG three and he starts wearing crazy socks. And so we'd have conversations about our crazy socks. Um, but anyway, I loved, I, I, I love covering the wizards uh, with that, with that group. That was fun. That was, and that was the way that ended, man. I was, I was so bummed out by it, but, um, but that, that was, there were so many great moments, you know, and you had other moments you remember, you know, covering, um, the Washington football team that, that were just crushing, you know, it's the, the, the death of Sean Taylor was just crushing. And I, I, I had no relationship with Sean Taylor. He, he did not talk to the media a lot. Um, he was just, he, what he was just, he wasn't standoffish or anything. You just knew he just didn't like it. So he was just going to kind of do his own thing, but I had so much respect for him as, as a player. And I loved watching him play so much. And I got to, know you know some of his teammates that have known him for a long time like Santana and Clinton Portis and the love that they had for him that it was just yeah I mean you hated seeing that 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 was one of those memories you just you you, you could wash from your mind it's like it's like when Len Bias passed you know I was in fifth grade and uh I was bawling my eyes out on my way to school when I heard about it like I just I, I couldn't I couldn't believe it that's one of those events where you remember exactly where you were the day and the minute that it happened. I was working yep. Morgan Wooten's basketball camp um, over at Tacoma Academy. And we were, I remember we were sitting around there, a few guys from Carroll High School and DeMatha, and we were just talking and we got the news and we were all just, miles just hit the floor. And my first cousin is Adrian Branch. So I got a chance to, you know, 
spent a lot of time growing up on College Park's campus, meeting Lenny and, you know, watching them through that 84 ACC championship team. So I definitely remember that time. When you think about coming back here to D.C., though, Dan, if you had one place to go grab a bite to eat, where is Dan Helley going to grab a bite? Oh, man. That's a great question. Um, man, I, you know, I lived, I lived in, in Bethesda and I will say that I was not very, uh, original. Um, I just kind of went to whatever restaurants were down there. I'm trying to remember the name of this pizza place that was down by Verizon center that, I loved it was like matchbox the best pizza. pizza. What is it? Matchbox. Pizza. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a bunch of matchboxes now, but I, that was the first one. Mm -hmm. That was the first run down by Verizon center. Yes. And I did. remember having that pizza and I would sometimes after games, I would, I would pick it up and take it home because it was so good. Um, Shout out I know that's to my not man. like, an, I know that's not like, not like an iconic DC institution, but I, I, people talk about your last supper. What would your last meal be? Yeah. So my uncle had a pizza shop. And I worked there growing up and a good pepperoni pizza is really, really hard to beat for me. <laughs> yeah. So late, late nights good. with a, a big slice coming out of Adams Morgan was always a, a, a favorite to try to get a little grease to suck up some of that alcohol. I was oh yeah, about. man. Wait, wait, it's jumbo slice, man. Jumbo, jumbo slice. slice. Big, I mean, there's made, so many right. different places down there. The jumbo slices, the trademark spot, but you got to go around the corner to get the real deal. Yeah, no, I, I, I remember that for sure. You know, it's funny. I, I grew up in Gaithersburg, went to high school in Rockville. You know, I, I was, my dad worked in the city, but I didn't really get to know DC as, as an adult until I moved back because I never lived there as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, so I still feel like there are so many nooks and crannies and restaurants and places that, uh, that I need to get back and try. And, and, you know, the wharf and all this stuff has been built up since I've been gone. It's, it's, it's different now. It's uh there's so much more, you know, I, I, we come back every year pre, prior to COVID we'd, you would come back twice a year and, and hang out for a while and see family and friends. And, you know, I take my kids to some Nats games and we come back in the winter and go to a Caps game. And um, I still feel like it's been a couple of years to where my kids have really just seen the city and soaked it in. They haven't been back in, they haven't been back in a year and a half now. You know, I haven't seen their grandparents in a year and a half because of because of COVID. I was lucky to stop in. Um, my son had a lacrosse tournament in Delaware, so we we flew in. We flew into DCA. Man, I, you know, I felt like I was a tourist again. You know, taking a picture <laughs> of the monument out the window, and yeah. um, so it was pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I fly every week, and I still do that, Dan. It never yeah, gets I, old when you when hey, you land it, you see the monument, and you're right by it. I don't know if it was uh, Doc Walker who always says it's the most powerful city in the world, but uh, I, I've I've taken that with me everywhere. I always I always claim I'm from the most powerful city in the world. Somebody, somebody, you know, like Chris would say, "Oh, you mean New York?" I said, "No, buddy. No, no actually, I, I don't." <laughs> I tell people this all the time. I'm from New York, and I feel like, and this might rub people the wrong way from New York. But I'm like, you take the really terrible stuff out of New York. You bring some politics and some great people in and you have Washington, D.C. When I started to appreciate D.C. more was uh, when I went to Europe and I was like, OK, let's go see these big cities in Europe. And I'm like, I'm from New York, checking out these cities in Europe. I'm like, I think D.C. is my favorite city. I think in the entire world that it, I have visited or had the opportunity to see, I think D.C. is my, my favorite city. And I stand by that. Well, it's definitely my favorite city. I mean, there's, it's, there's, there's no close second. Um, but one thing that's given me more appreciation for it is, uh, is traveling, like you said, going to Europe and seeing the, the history there. You know, we got a couple hundred years of history. I mean, there's a couple thousand over there, which is, which is pretty wild when you, you know, you, you're on the Seine River and you're going underneath those bridges. You're like, man, this thing's been here for 1,200 years. So you're not a left coast is the best coast guy. You, well, you I will switch to that yet. I will say this: I, I there's no other state in the country like California where you can do as much as you can here. I mean, a it's huge, right? But where can you go surfing and skiing in the same day? Um, you know, where do you have within driving distance 
Santa Barbara, San Diego, you know, LA. One, one of the things I didn't realize when I got here was you're surrounded by mountains. I just didn't realize the topography of, of LA. I never, you know, and I, in my mind, this is how dumb I was, dumb I am. I just figured, oh, it's going to be like Florida without the humidity. It's not, you know, where I live, it's, it's cool. It's, it's, you know, most days year round, it's between 68 and 75 degrees every day. You know, my house does not have air conditioning because it doesn't generally get hot enough to, to need air conditioning, uh, which sounds crazy, right? I mean, it just doesn't. See, if you were an English major, you would have known this. What was it Mark Twain when he said uh, the coldest winter I've ever spent was a summer in San Francisco? Well, that's true. That's <laughs> true. I do remember you. that. But San Francisco's different. No, you know, Northern California, very different than Southern California. But uh, see, I, I mean, got Chris, my geography wrong there. Got Chris, my English right, but my geography wrong. I, I, I mean, I was a broadcasting major. And, and it, I mean, I did it because that's what I wanted to do. But it was also one of the easier majors. So yeah, I, I probably, <laughs> in hindsight, I love everything, every choice I made about, about college. Um, but I, I would have taken more um, like financial classes. I would have learned more about the market. And I just, I hated math and I wasn't really good at it. So I think I took one econ class and I said that that's it, you know, and I took the math that I had to take to graduate and that was it, but I would have taken more um, just, it's just, to, I wasn't, I, when I got into the, the professional world, I, I didn't even, you know, barely knew what a 401k was. I, I didn't know anything about the market. Um, I still don't know a lot about it, but I just wish I was more educated on that. Cause you can, you can be, as you know, Chris, and Ted, you can be a, a a broadcaster having majored in political science. Like you just have to get an internship and get a resume taped together, and then and then get going. But now uh, with the advent of social media, you really have to know marketing and yeah to, to market yourself. It's all about how many likes did you have on you know whatever you know social media platform. So really trying to market yourself in this industry is a a, a big deal to as far as your advancement is concerned. It is. And some people are really, really good at it. You know, um, I have a friend who works up in Philadelphia. His name's John Clark. He's the lead guy at the NBC uh, sports network there and, and, uh, and the M and the NBC station. And um, he uses his feed as a news source and he is constantly on it, just going, just churning out content, you know? Um, and he, he's like, he's a template, I think for a local or regional sports guy um in that sense and he's, he's really really good uh, but that that's helped a lot of people you know perfect example somebody i used to work with at nbc4 diana rossini she would break stories on twitter she had very good sources and she was like twitter was her main source of breaking news because you could do that faster than you could do it on the air and it helped her get a job at espn and she's doing great now as one of their lead nfl reporters um so yeah, social media has really changed the game. You know, you can't, you can't be, there's certain jobs where it's, it's not a necessity. You know, there are still, you know, play by play guys who, who aren't on Twitter, which I don't recommend. I think you should have some type of presence. Um, but uh, I, I think as a, as an anchor reporter, you know, I started doing a podcast a year ago and that's where you do the majority of the promotion is on Twitter and Instagram and, you know, Facebook for the, for the, the ones that are the older people, the kids yeah. don't get on Facebook anymore, but um, you're right. Some people are really good at it and not everybody is. That's that, that's a talent in its own right is being able to uh, figure out how to kind of, for lo lack of a better phrase, self promote and, and, and use uh, social media to help build and build your brand. Speaking of which uh, everybody can find you on the helipod, which is a great name for a podcast. Catch you there, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, I know it's, it's been fun. I started, um, I had this idea prior to COVID and was pitching it to some different platforms here in LA and then COVID hit and everything kind of came to a standstill as you guys remember. And I said, screw it, let's just launch this on my own. And then I finally ended up joining a podcast network and I've had some really fun interviews on the pod. It started as just an interview driven podcast where we take one guy, we would kind of deep dive into his career, do his origin story, talk a lot about his rookie year, the transformation from playing days to post-playing career. A lot of these guys I've talked to have been broadcasters. 
we've also sat down with some current NFL players and head coaches. You know, Mike Vrabel was on the pod. I went to Sean McVay's house and sat in the backyard, had a great conversation with him. Um, and it's been cool to watch it grow and gain traction. I remember after Mc, the McVay interview, I was up in Lake Tahoe this past summer and my phone started blowing up and they were running clips of the interview on sports center, which I thought was pretty cool. And, That's awesome. um, you know, it's, some, it's, it's, it's mine. It's something I built and, and I ha I've had some help with it. I hired a couple of guys to help me. And, um, it's certainly, it's a passion project, you know, podcasts don't, you don't, you don't make money overnight on podcasts. So this is something I'm doing because I love it. <laughs> um, and I've been able to, to get some great interviews and I'm actually right. As soon as this is over, uh, I'm going to tape, uh, this week's pod with Maurice Jones drew, who's my co-host during football season. And will come on periodically. Um, and then uh, we have Steve Mariucci on that we're going to uh, drop next week. Um, and then uh, and then we'll see who's down the road. I think Ryan Leaf. Ryan Leaf and I both filled in on the Rich Eisen show last one. week, and we were yeah. talking a little bit. And um, he's he's an he's a, a unbelievable kind of comeback story, right? His NFL career didn't go as he had planned and um, had some trouble, troubles with alcohol and then you know kind of came back and is, is broadcasting now and, and launched his own podcast, did some stuff for ESPN, so – um, I think he'll be a good, good story too. That's the thing guys about, as you've seen with podcasts, we can just go, right? There's no, you know, Andre's not in your ear telling you when to rap. I don't think, you know, no. you can just talk. And, you know, when I was doing a daily show at NFL network, my favorite part of the day was sitting in the green room, just talking to the guys, whether we would have an in-studio guest or whether it was Willie McGinnis or LaDainian Tomlinson or Kurt Warner, just chopping it up with mm -hmm. story time. Right. And you didn't have the time in a one hour show as crazy as that sounds to really get into story time and everything was very rehearsed, right? All right. You got, you're going to say this, you're going to say this, then I'm going to say this. And I would always say in those meetings, I said, save it for the show. Let's, let's save it for the show. You know, they need to know the producers need to know what the, the players are going to talk about because they want to be able to match the video with the content that is coming out of their mouth, which I totally understand. But once you know that, I don't want to know every detail. Right. I think spontaneity is, is one of the best parts of TV and it makes it real. So if I know exactly what they're going to say, and then I know the, the, the exact nugget I'm going to use after they say that, um, it, to me, that's not as fun. And that's one of the reasons I like calling games is because you have this huge bucket of information, but you don't know when you're going to use it. You don't know how you're going to use it and you don't know if you're going to use it. And so after a great game, you'll probably have 50% of your content that you prepared for that game with still in the bucket. And that's good because if you've used everything, then the game was crappy, you know? <laughs> so you want that good game. You hope you don't have to use it all. That's what happened when I did the, the Washington Detroit game this year. We had all these great stories about Alex and Ron and, you know, from our production meeting with them, but the game turned out to be a great game, you know, Washington lost on a last second kick. Um, but, but it was a great, it was a great second half. Yeah, this has been a great second half to the podcast. I know you have to run and get to your podcast. So, Dan Helly, Hollywood is what they call him, man. Thanks for stepping to the mic today. We appreciate you. Hey, Chris and Ted, I appreciate it, man. Good luck with the pod. Take care of Andre for me. He's one of my favorite people in the world. I know he's uh, producing this thing for you guys. Yeah. Um, the math guy goes way back with Ted, but he goes way back with me, too. You know, I interned for him at Channel 9 way back in the day, and we've kept in touch for a long, long time. He is, he is good people. And I appreciate you guys having me on. Good luck with everything. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Dan. Appreciate it.